Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 16 of the Rock and Roll Beer Guy podcast. This episode is brought to you by Audible. If you use our link, audibletrial.com slash RRBG, you can get yourself a free 30-day trial and a free audiobook from their selection of over 180,000 titles. This podcast is also brought to you by Blue Apron. If you go to rockandrollbeerguy.wordpress.com, you can use our link there to sign up and get $30 off your first order, plus free shipping. In this episode, I talked to Jay Wade Edwards. He is an editor that has worked on several shows, including Aqua Teen Hunger Force, Space Ghost Coast to Coast, Squid Billies, Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell, Wander Over Yonder, and many more. This is a special episode because I actually go to Jay's house and we sit there and drink beer while doing the podcast. It's the first time I've done a bottle share podcast, and we ended up having a really great conversation. I hope you enjoy. Cheers. My name! Welcome everyone to the Rock and Roll Beer Guy podcast. This is a special episode. We're sitting in the house apartment of Mr. J. Wade Edwards and uh, drinking some beers that I brought, drinking some beers that he's going to share with me. This is the first time doing this, so it should be interesting. You'll be very jealous. <laughs> the, the cellars have been emptied for this particular podcast. It's yes. a very special podcast. Very special podcast. Thank you for letting me in your house. Cheers. Cheers, Cheers to you. Mm. We're being watched by Buzz the Wonder Dog. So if you hear uh, a bark, that's that's Buzz. <laughs> I like how calm and relaxed he is. He's used to this. Um, the celebrities coming through every day. No, that's not, that's, <laughs> not, that's not true at all. I'll take that. I'll take that. You called me a celebrity. I'm good. I'm ready. That's right. <laughs> shall, shall I introduce myself? Sure. What do you do? Listeners? What do I do? What um, do you do? Uh, I am a beer professional. That's right. Um, but I, but my day job is uh, editing film and television. So for many years, I worked for Adult Swim in Atlanta, and I edited the pilot for Aqua Teen Hunger Force on Adult Swim, and hung around and worked on that show for 12 years. 12 years. So if any of your, if any of your listeners have questions about the fart sound effects library, <laughs> I have the answers. So there is a fart sound effects library? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Sometimes you have to foley to get just the right one, <laughs> but normally I can, I can pretty much nail... Whatever fart joke you're going, you're going for. I have that kind of power and experience. So, okay, uh, when foleying these fart sounds, what is the most common thing that you use to recreate uh, farts? Um, a moistened uh, palm of your hand and your mouth. Really? Kind of a... <laughs> <laughs> Not like a... I, when I was younger, there was these weird like jelly things that oh, you yeah. press in. You can it... press in. I've seen some people do that, but, the, but if you get a good fart... Special like fart foley artist. Okay, they can really do it with the with their hands with 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 a wet palm of the hand. That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah. Uh, so wow. Have you, so did you? <laughs> it's a yes, great I, way to start. Yes. Fart sounds. So you edited every episode of Aqua Team? Uh No, there were two other two or three other editors working all the time. Okay. Um, but I edited. I think I worked there from 2000 to 2012, and then moved to Los Angeles. Jeez. Uh, the show continued till 2014, uh, ended about then, 2014, 2015. Uh, so I ended up cutting about 90 episodes. Wow. That's... I also worked on Squidbillies and a couple other shows there. While I was yeah, there. so you did Squidbillies, you did Space Ghost, I Coast worked to Coast? Pre-Aqua Teen, I worked on Space Ghost, Coast to Coast. I cut about 30 episodes of that from 96 to 2001. Wow. That's awesome. <laughs> and now you're working on Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell. And now I'm editing still with Adult Swim. I, uh, I'm freelance, so uh, I do different stuff. But one of the gigs is editing episodes of uh, Your Pretty Face is Going to Hell, which is, a, which is essentially a cartoon, but with live action actors. <laughs> yeah, that talking computer thing is very interesting. <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 uh, it's interesting how they produce the show. Um, they write all the scripts all at once. It's not like... Writing and production is happening at the same time. So all the scripts are written up front, and then they shoot all the scripts out of order in one production block, like six episodes at a time. Mm. And it's all in studio and a lot of green screen. Okay. So that way they can shoot six episodes in two to three weeks. And with a lot of room for improv and that thing. They really let the actors run, That's run good. with that stuff. That's one of the things that makes me a fan of what Adult Swim does is just 
they seem to embrace the spontaneous humor or just random things that maybe at the time, like if you see it and you're not in the right context, it just seems odd. But then it, it, if you fall into the, the world, the universe of it, then it's perfect. Yeah. That's that's exactly how I just described Aqua Teen. Is it makes no sense for the first one or two episodes, <laughs> yeah. but once it clicks in, mm. you kind of forget that they're food, <laughs> and Master Shade becomes that roommate you had in college that ma- made you crazy. And mm-hmm. yeah, the that show was was very crafted in post. It was very well written, and then the voiceover artists do a lot of improv and add their personality to it. But then we'd also do a lot of crafting in post to make those conversations feel natural. When actually all the voiceover people were recorded separately. Gotcha. So that's one of the points I had written down was uh, when you're doing edits, because I do it with the podcast sometimes too, where I edit out certain empty spaces and and just to get the timing right, the phrasing or get the flow of the podcast to keep it interesting because some people lose interest. How important is that, like to have comedic timing? Because I would say even more so than the performer or the comedian who's doing the voices, it's the editing. Uh, Thank you. (laughs) Uh, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Aqua Teen and Space Ghost were put together like no other show on television yeah. ever. Space Ghost, you had an interview that was done with someone pretending to be Space Ghost. Mm. And then they'd transcribe that and rewrite all the questions for comedic effect. Right, right. So I'd have a finite celebrity interview and then a script that was recorded. And then the other variable in that show was George Lowe, who's the voice of Space Ghost. It's a crazy person. Like certified? Yeah. <laughs> Um, he would just go on these amazing rants that might last 20 minutes. Okay. And the, sometimes that was the most, that was as interesting as what was written. So in post, I would literally transcribe his entire VO session. And then we'd use that with the interview, kind of making up conversations from two things that were completely, <laughs> essentially improvised. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah. And that was some of the, that's why that show had such weird timing. Because you'd come up with this conversation, and then you didn't have any way to transition to the next conversation. So you just put in a pregnant pause. Of right. Space Ghost looking at Zorak. Zorak looking at Space Ghost. And then you'd start over. <laughs> um, so that was an interesting show to work on. And, and again, it wasn't animated in a traditional sense. All the animation was already composited. Wasn't it from like other older cartoons? Or was that Sea Lab? I'd, I'd say maybe 30 or 40% of it was original Space Ghost animation from the 60s okay. that was then rotoscoped, okay. colored out, and then put on top of the new Coast to Coast set. Wow. And then probably 50, you know, by the time we get into full, after the first two or three years, they were making new animations all the time. And maybe at least half of it was new animations. But it was all composited. So it was animated in quotes by just re-editing this library of footage to mm-hmm. match the new script. Now, would you say that's more a cost-effective method? or Because it seems <laughs> to be more labor-intensive than actually just animating fresh. It's, Aqua Teen was the same way. The pilot is very expensive, because that's creating your entire library for the whole, essentially the whole series. Right. And after that, it's very cost-effective, because your crew is editors, is just an editor. Mm-hmm. And... Back then, it was the 90s, you had an offline editor who was working at low resolution on a computer, and then you had to conform it at high resolution, which back then was just standard def TV. Wow, okay. Um, so that's a different kind of offline, online process. But you really, like, and sometimes we'd spend 12 weeks on a quarter hour show, on a 12 minute show, <laughs> writing and rewriting and making it work. Um, so sometimes you just get tired of a joke, even though no one had seen it. <laughs> right, right. It's it's uh, kind of akin to like musicians. Like you write a song and then you practice it a million times before you perform it out live. And then by the time you play it live, you're just tired of it. Yes, right? <laughs> yes, yes. Yeah. Um, so that that was an interesting thing. And and yeah, the last day and a half, two days of once the show was actually locked in in the in the offline phase was opening and closing Space Ghost mouth with one frame edits. Oh my god. One and two frame edits. So you're essentially lip flap. We call it lip flap. You're essentially lip flapping by just doing these micro edits back to back to back to back to back. And that usually took a day or two of just that. So that's kind of like animating. Like you're just animating straight up. Animating with edits. With edits. Wow. Now, um, well, first of all, let me, what are we drinking right now? We're drinking the Kill Switch Engage Cigar City Brewing IPA. What do you think? It's delicious. I am generally not a... malty, not hoppy, uh-huh. um, but I find this to be very delicious, and since it's the, it's a good place to start. Right. I wanted to start with that just because I know we're going to jump into some stouts, and it's going to get dark quick. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it's going to get dark. Yeah, it's going to get dark in every sense of the word. Yeah. Um, I, gr- I grew up uh, about an hour from 
Cigar City in Florida. That's awesome. Back but before they were there. <laughs> when did, yeah, I was going to say, when did you leave that area? As soon as I could. <laughs> I, I always say I didn't leave Florida, I escaped. Yeah, well, that's how I felt. That's how I felt <laughs> when I got here. Like, you oh know, um, growing up in Florida is different than growing up in, like, small town anywhere else. Because mm-hmm. if you're in small town Kansas, you got four directions you could go. Mm-hmm. Chicago, yeah. Kansas City, Denver, you know. In Florida, <laughs> like where I was south of Tampa, you had to drive eight hours and you had only gotten to Macon. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's one of the biggest issues with bands playing in like Miami, where I grew up. Nobody, nobody, nobody wants to go it. down there. No, it's such a waste of gas. It's unbelievable <laughs> how far from the state line to Miami is. People yeah. don't realize that it's ten hours. Yeah, and you could do an entire like week tour of Florida because you oh, hit yeah. Miami. You go if you want to even go further. You go to the Keys, do Miami, do like cent- like Broward, West Palm Beach area, sure, Central Florida, and then Tampa, you- Orlando, Jacksonville. Yeah, yeah, it's so crazy. People don't realize that Pensacola is closer to Houston than Miami. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's super, it's, it's out crazy. there. It's the panhandle. Yeah. Went out there for Panama City, MTV Spring Break one year. And my buddies had just gotten signed by this uh, by Roadrunner. And they, they, they were performing out on TV for MTV Spring Break. And, we're, you know, these are really good friends of ours. So we're like, I'm going out there with you, man. We're, we're going to go party in the hotel, do the whole thing. One of the many dumb moments of my life, would jump off a second floor <laughs> balcony onto a mattress that we put in the ground. What? We took the mattress out of the hotel room, threw it off the balcony, so it landed like in the parking lot, and then we jumped off the balcony onto the mattress. How did you not break everything? Oh, I did. <laughs> uh, I mean, nothing broke specifically, but my knees are destroyed now. You know? <laughs> the, now that I'm 35, everything hurts when I wake up in the morning. I have to stretch for 35 minutes. That's what it's, happens. It's what happens. I'm, I'm, I'm with you. I'm in the same you, boat. You make dumb mistakes like that. Like you're young and crazy, and like we're drunk and woo, spring break. There's also just an element of you live long enough, so everything hurts all the time. Right. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Going back to the editing real quick. Yeah. Well, when you were working for Adult Swim, were you in the studio interacting with the directors and creators? Uh, do you have creative input, or was it mostly just like here, do this? Um, there was a lot of creative input. In uh, in Aqua Team, I, I, I've I've my professional career has had the two extremes, where I spent twelve years on Aqua Team, where the scripts are great. Dave and Matt write very very funny scripts, but they also allow for every stage of production to improve the scripts. Okay. So they let the they hired very good actors to or do the voices themselves. To <laughs> if something looks right on the page, once you get in the booth, it may not sound right. So there's lots of room to rewrite the script or at least rewrite each individual line in the booth. Gotcha. And then they also take a lot of detours off the script. It's like, here's a funny line that could lead to this line that could lead to this line. And so there's a lot of detours that are scribbled on the script and it kind of becomes a little chaotic. So they hand that chaos to the editors, (laughs) put it together, run away and yell, I hope there's a show there. (laughs) I'm exaggerating a bit. Yeah, but kind of. No. Um, and so the editors would get a week or two to put together the radio show with sound effects and music of how we think it might go in the final program. And it's usually always a little long. Sometimes it'd be, you know, we get a quarter hour of television is about 11 and a half, 12 minutes of airtime. So we might get a 15, 17 minute radio show. So we got to cut that down to 12 minutes and some jokes don't work. Some, you know. And with the Aqua Teen scripts, because it was a small crew and we'd all been working there so, lo- so long, often the script would be interior, house, and then three pages of dialogue. <laughs> okay. So there was no storyboard artist in that scenario. The editor would just use a library of backgrounds and generic character animations to essentially storyboard the show in, at, that point, fi- at that time Final Cut Pro. Right. So we were first past directors and editors and kind of rewriting the show. And then Dave or Matt would come in and we'd work through what worked and didn't work and they'd give us notes and then we'd go away and they'd go away because they were busy doing... There's just two guys, yeah, Dave and Matt, who were essentially writing and producing every episode. And they also had other shows at Adult Swim. So they would go back and forth between different shows. So they relied on the editors to because we worked on the show a long time and like I had been, you know, I ended up working with Dave between Space Ghost and Aqua Teen for 17 years. Wow. Yeah. That's crazy. <laughs> yeah, it is. That's a, that's a whole human life. <laughs> it's a whole human life, yes. <laughs> People that were born when I started were in high school and should not have been watching my show, but they generally were. Yeah, usually that's the case with shows like that, or like South Park, where it's like super dirty or just a little out there. 
uh, kids end up gravitating towards it because it is rebellious for them. You for know? sure. Me growing up, it was uh, Eddie Murphy delirious. Absolutely. You know, I'm like a, a kid and I, I don't watch that. Of course I want to watch that. Move it out of the way. Let me see that. You know, and, uh, it's it's great. It's, yeah. that, I think parents sometimes do uh, protect their child too much from stuff like that. Obviously, you can't expose them to, you know, I, I feel that other things get away with it easier, like video games, like game of, you know, um, Grand Theft Auto or Call of Duty. Absolutely. Because you know, parents aren't, can't sit there and watch every second. Right. And you're in there. These dudes are in, communicating on the internet to each other, yelling obscenities, and then just also murdering each other on the, <laughs> on the internet. It's slightly different than watching a cartoon that's going to make them question things, you know? Absolutely. So, Absolutely. Uh, so that was one kind of extreme. And, and if something wasn't working in the edit, since Dave and Matt were half the voices of the show, they could rewrite and re-record a scene... And, or a couple of lines, we'd have a new scene within an hour. The contrast to that is I spent three years when I moved to L.A. working for Disney TV animation. So I worked on Gravity Falls and uh, Craig McCracken, who created the Powerpuff Girls, his show for Disney called Wander Over Yonder. Both yeah. great shows, yeah. but a completely different world, world of production. Um, that was very storyboard heavy. Mm. Um, so you had animation directors, storyboard artists, revisionists. So by the time it got to edit, really all of the story decisions had been made. Right, yeah. And it was more about executing. And it was more of an action show than Adult Swim, which is more talky. Yeah. So it was more about timing, action, cutting a lot of sound effects. And so I might get 1,500, 2,000 storyboards for a single quarter hour episode. And the other difference is with Disney, like a se- one season of Wander Over Yonder, season two of Wander Over Yonder was 22 half hour episodes which is really f- almost 44 quarter-hour episodes. So that's 44 stories that have to be written, broken, storyboarded, edited. So it's a marathon. Yeah, yeah. Literally 44 weeks in a row, Craig is pitching the new batch of storyboards to executives. Wow. Um, and then you get a week or two to cut it together, and then and that's shown to executives, and then you block it and it gets shipped overseas and comes back in three to four, six months. Yeah, so the Disney would, not in a negative connotation, but just it's more of a job, right? It's right. it's a little more, I mean, you still have creative input, but like all the storytelling decisions have been made before it gets to edit. Right, the creative comes in with, like you said, explosions or action sure, sequences or sure. something like that. I got very familiar with what's the difference between a Disney sound effect and a Warner Brothers sound effect. Tell me about that. What's that? Disney sound effects are more musical, Okay. whereas Warner Brothers sound effects are more visceral. They're more, a little more real life, okay. splatty. Okay. You know, I need a, I need a good Warner Brothers splat here, or I need a Disney wow. zing. Gotcha, you know, gotcha. so you really get to know. You mm. know, there's, there was one. Whenever a body slammed into something, there was one sound effect we always used, which was a cinder block, okay, falling onto the ground, which had a really good thud and crunch, mm. like a bone crunch. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Buried in there. Wow. And whereas Aqua Teen, there was no cartoony sound effects. It was all real life. There was never a boing. You know? It was all right. real life. Yeah. 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 It was uh, all real life sound effects. Hmm. I yeah. was going to ask, uh, since you mentioned real life and sound effects, the Aqua Teen explosions every time somebody <laughs> drops something in the ground. Was that something that, that you had any input in? Or is that a, was that written in or was that improv in? At some point where they thought it'd be funny if everything just blew up when it touched the ground. Uh, this isn't... So there's Dave and Matt. Dave Willis, Matt Malera, who created the show and wrote every episode. I, I can tell which jokes are Dave's and which jokes are Matt after working with him for so long. And Dave was a little more... And this is very... A lot of overlap. But Dave was a little more story. And the stories are chaotic. Whereas Matt would add in the chaos. You know, he'd be like, have the kind of... Just make that explode. And if we wrote ourselves in a corner, much like Space Ghost, we just, instead of a pregnant pause, we just have something explode. Gotcha, gotcha. Uh, there's a, <laughs> I got two stories about that. Okay. We needed a library of explosions. And this is like season one, season two. And so we wanted to buy this library of explosions. I think it was like $500. Wow. <laughs> for a library of beauties and mats. Okay. Which is how you used to composite things back then. You had a beauty, which was an explosion over black. And then you had a black and white version of that explosion they used to color it out. Anyway, technical nerd. No, but that's good. I, I, that's interesting. <laughs> um, and so <laughs> Adult Swim was so cheap, we had to split. We, had to, <laughs> we, had to, we could buy that library of explosions, but we had to split it with C-Lab at the time. 
<laughs> okay. So we both could use the same library. And we use that library of standard def explosions the, in, the whole series. Right. Same with every time something caught on fire, it was actually footage of a real campfire that was shot for Space Ghost. Okay. When he interviewed Hanson, he took the band Hanson camping. <laughs> And we shot just a close-up of a fire, and it got dark, so it was a great, easy mat to mat out the black. Yeah. And just use the fire. So whenever anything caught on fire, it, it was, was a, this... It was the Hanson campfire. It was the Hanson campfire. Even <laughs> if it was a candle, we would just car- crop off the corners and use the Hanson campfire as <laughs> candle. Anyway, so there's that. That's great. That's great. And so the explosions, we just kept using over and over again. And yeah, anytime something fell, it would just explode, because it's a funny gag. Right. And it doesn't have to make sense in that universe. It just, you do it enough, that's just how things work. Wow. <laughs> that's great. That's awesome. I'm going to open up another beer real quick. Uh, oh, please. And while you're doing that, I have one more story. Do it. Do it. Do it. Do it. We did a, an extra, I, did, I produced and, uh, and edited all the extra content for the DVDs. Okay. Okay, so I think it was volume three or four. There was always that button that you hit that said play all. Yes. That's what I, that was part of my story. Go for it. Yes, tell me more. <laughs> and instead of playing all back to back, we played them all at once on a split screen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which people complained about for years. <laughs> years. They hated that. No, I loved it. So I, loved it so I put much. that together. It oh. was 12 episodes all playing at once, maybe 16, on a grid. So I built that and, and did it. And as we were like one to like, literally, did you ever watch it all the way through? Yes. I'll, did you I'll tell you the story. Did you notice anything towards about the nine-minute mark? Oh, I wouldn't be able to point it out right now, no. About the nine-minute mark of watching all these episodes at the same time, we started to notice that things started to explode. Okay, yes. So yes. they, like, just add explosions to all the episodes. <laughs> so literally, I just kind of, like, would watch them, and I added fake explosions, like, right. that weren't necessarily part of the original episode, to the but to the you know little squares in the grid yeah. that didn't normally have them, so it became <laughs> kind of this visual gag oh, that man. literally probably no one watched or noticed. It just made us laugh, which is typical of the whole series. If it made us laugh, we we went and did it. Right, right. Well, I have a nice little story. Then this is great because oh. this is a the yeah, most fantastic. By the way, for those listening, we just opened up Prairie Artisan Ales Pirate Bomb. And I believe I've had this bottle for about two and a half, three years, maybe. It smells oh, great. Oh, it's amazing. It's one of my favorites that they do, by the way. It's almost graham cracker. It's almost like a s'mores. Oh, my it was like a graham cracker chocolate. Yeah, it's the rum, man. And uh, they also put, what else do they put in there? Cacao, cacao nibs. Oh, good Lord. Vanilla beans, chilies, and coffee. And then aged in rum barrels. That's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, oh. It's the liquid brownie, but it. That there's almost like a little marsh, like because it's in my head, I've. There's almost a little marshmallow sweetness. Well, the vanilla uh, gives it that, mm. that marshmallowiness. Okay, so here's a story for you then. Mm. I'm trying to think what year it was. Probably 2006 or seven. I think six. My band performed a show. Uh, this is in Miami? In, my, in Miami, yeah. Down south in Homestead. Oh, my grandparents lived in Homestead. Oh, nice. My, the band that I was in for like 10 years, that was our home base. Like We had a house out there in the middle of nowhere. And we could just play in the Redlands. I'd assume it's like a retirement town. It is, more or less. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Like the rest of Florida. Yeah, we were in a far out there. And like, the first time I ever went to that house, I thought I was getting murdered. Like, <laughs> they're like, oh, they're taking me out here to kill me. Fantastic. <laughs> oh, you were in Florida. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so we played the show, and a buddy of mine ran up to me. He's like, hey, man, I got mushrooms. <laughs> I'm like, okay, cool. So he gives me these capsules, and he's like, there's like, Four caps of mushrooms grinded down with vitamin C and ginseng and all this stuff. We put it in these capsules. And I ate like one or two. I don't remember how many I ate. But I was like, sure, whatever. Played a show. And I ended up in his house. And uh, and I might be telling the story like completely off timeline wise. But I know I ended up on his couch tripping out and just like, hey, man, I need to just chill. Can we just chill here and watch something? So he puts on that DVD <laughs> And hits play all. And I'm tripping out looking at all the episodes at once. Just like, <gasps> And we just both sat there screaming and laughing our heads off the entire time. We watched the whole thing until the end and tripping on mushrooms. It was an enlightening experience. That's awesome. And the world all comes in full circle. <laughs> well, I think, I think my, my hidden 
you know, the kind of kind of Easter egg of extra explosions <laughs> definitely helped. hit you at just the right spot. <laughs> definitely helped, man. It's so funny. He's actually messaging me right now on Facebook, which Cheers. is great. Cheers, Cheers, Cheers man. Thank you for that experience. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Mm-hmm. To tie it up even more, because this is just crazy, he's messaging right now, and he also designed the, the logo for the podcast. Nice. He's the one that Small did time. the cartoon phase with the cigar. I love it. Yeah, yeah. Speaking about mushrooms, yes. so everybody that I know has a fair assumption or thinks that you guys are all tripping out while making this show. I know that that's not true because you got to get work done. Right. But um, how much involvement is there? None. None at all? None at all. We okay. go to the office. It's a marathon to make a, like I said, it's more true at Disney where from the time the writing started on season two of Wander Yonder until they delivered the last episode, one season of animated television was two and a half years of work. Jesus. And editing was a year and change of cutting storyboards Mm -hmm. and then a year and change of conforming uh, animation from overseas. And that's just the editing. Like there's an army. It's not quite an army. It's, it's not, it's a little, it's leaner than you think. 40? Crap. No, I'd say it's hard to say because a lot of, Show there's many shows that share pers- personnel. Mm-hmm. Three editors, two editors and assistant, two directors, probably four or five storyboard artists. I think uh, three or four writers, the showrunner Craig, various producers and production personnel that kind of keep track of everything that everyone is doing. Yeah, and then it goes overseas. And I don't know how many people work on it over there. Jeez, you hire a company to do the animation. We deliver as much detail as we can. So mm-hmm. They do it right. And then there's, you know, there's the army of Disney, the, the Disney machine that puts it on the air. So <laughs> Sprinkle it with Disney magic. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so as opposed to Adult Swim, which was David Matt who wrote and directed everything, zero storyboard artist. There, we had um, an animation company that would do the new villain of the week. Um, so that was an animator or two doing a new villain that was also done in kind of this generic way. Um, we knew there were specific moves they needed to make, but they were done in a way to where we could cut it and re- and change it, depending on how the script changed. There's a guy named Bob Pettit who did all our backgrounds for almost the entire run of the season, so he worked full time. Yeah. If the Aqua Teams went to a new location, yeah, it's a new background. Yeah. A new background. So he drew all those, almost photorealistic. Those backgrounds were incredible. Yeah, they're really great. And our sweet the guy who mixed and sweetened the show. Oh, and and then and then uh, we had after uh, the show was. Rough cut in Final Cut Pro, and then composite in After Effects. Okay. So there was three or four After Effects guys. So when they and it, I say guys because a generic term. There were women involved. Right, right, right. But it's animation. It tends to be kind of dude-centric. <laughs> okay. Uh, so yeah, like a crew of ten people. That's pretty crazy. Soup to nuts, all done in Atlanta. Box to wire. And you're all in, a, in the same like office, like cubicles type um, deal? or William Street. Yeah. Uh, was where all the editing was done, the writing was done. And then we, we went through a couple of different local Atlanta animation studios that did the After Effects compositing. You know, Atlanta's um, blowing up right now, which is crazy. Production, like at last I saw 69 TV shows and movies shooting this summer in Atlanta. Yeah, it's crazy. Seven billion dollars. It's incredible. It's the new, it's the new Hollywood. Man. It's the new, it's, it's a production hub and I love that it's, that legislation has the guts to stick with the tax credits because other, other states have started and then kind of like chickened out or for some pol- politic reasons discontinued them. Uh, Georgia has embraced them. And now it's something like $7 billion worth of production comes in. Now development, which is the – and writing rooms and post is still in L.A. Yeah. So that's kind of why I moved. There was more opportunity. As much as I loved Adult Swim and working on Aqua Teen, it was time to do something different after 12 years of fart jokes. And <laughs> I, I'm not belittling the show. I love the show. For sure. It's for sure. It's great. Do you have kids? No kids. Do you plan on kids? No. Okay. No, so no, I was no. going to say sometimes people do that that switch to kind of leave like a legacy for their children that they that could be more than just fart jokes. <laughs> 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 no, I'm also a writer. I, I also uh, write and direct, and I made a indie feature ten years ago, mm-hmm. and I make I direct music videos and do shorts. I shot and edited my own web series last year, so I do other stuff. And L.A. is just where that all, you know, in my parlance, this is where they make the TVs. I want my puppet show in the TV. Right, 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 right. Yeah, it, it is true. And it's one of those things that that whole chasing the dream that people do. It, everybody was like, move to Hollywood, man. Become a star. You know, like that's the dream. And uh, But it really is a place to do that. There's so much, like, yeah, after it, working for 
almost 20 years in Atlanta, I gravitated towards working towards Cartoon Network when I was a staff editor at Turner Broadcasting because that was the only place that was doing original content. And I wanted to do long format stuff. Mm-hmm. I was cutting promos and commercials and that kind of stuff, but I wanted to tell stories. So you got slightly longer format with like 15 minutes. <laughs> yes, yes, <laughs> yes. 15 um, minute shows. Yeah. yeah. So that's just because that's what I gravitated towards. And Space Ghost was a very hard show to work on. We went through a lot of we went through a lot of very talented editors who were either good at the technical side, but maybe not good at the comedic timing or vice versa. Right, right. Um, because again, you had to open and close Space Ghost mouth two frames at a time, but you also had to have comedic timing. How long is that beat going to be? Yeah, you know? there's there's also the weird like if you want to touch on a, a specific comedic nerve where like he's saying something and you just leave the mouth open and it just looks trippy and weird <laughs> at that moment in time. You know? There are a few edit jokes, mm-hmm. editor editor only jokes in that show. So yeah, for for whatever reason, I stuck around and ended up cutting about thirty episodes of Space Ghost. Nice. Well, um, for whatever I, reason, it's a good show. <laughs> I credit I credit Florida Heat. Like I didn't go out and play in the summer. I stayed home and watched Dick Van Dyke show. Florida sucks. Man. <laughs> God. I credit the Dick Van Dyke show for all my uh, editing chops. Okay. You, you watched? Uh, WGN, growing up, would show the Dick Van Dyke show back-to-back in the morning. And then they'd show the Bozo show, and then they'd show a Cubs game. Okay. And that was pretty much my summers through middle school, through, through my formative years. So when did you leave Florida? What, what age? Uh, I graduated from high school in 86. Okay. At 17. 17. And I went to college in Alabama. I went to Auburn University. I was five years old. <laughs> I understand. Yeah. I understand. And uh, I took, a, I was like, Auburn, I wanted to go to Auburn because it was a, a right, a proper distance from my parents. Mm-hmm. And it was a very nice campus. People were super nice. Uh, and it, there was a change of season. Do you remember, like you've lived in Florida and California. So maybe you haven't experienced Well, this. no, no, yes. I actually, I was born in New Jersey. Oh, okay. Yeah, so I know what seasons are. <laughs> when I went to Alabama the first fall, like looking outside my dorm room window, the trees were changing colors. Yeah. And it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen because in Florida, I'd never seen anything like that. Nope. People don't realize that. Uh, the rest of the country doesn't realize that. Where it's A lot of Floridians complain online, but it's true, man. We have, or we had, I don't live there anymore, thank God. Um, <laughs> we, had, we had uh, eight months of summer and maybe... Two months of spring and maybe sure. a month of winter that wasn't really winter. Right. Like the old fall. joke is there's two seasons, summer and January. Yeah. <laughs> summer and January, yeah. Actually, it's been pushing later and later with uh, whatever's going on with yeah. the climate. Uh, yeah. It's February. I, I was now. getting bit by mosquitoes when I was home for Christmas last oh, year. God. That's another reason I wanted out of there so bad. <laughs> I, I, I don't know if it's because I drink a lot of beer and there's a lot of sugar in me, but oh, man. <laughs> mosquitoes are bad. Oh, I was worried because we had Zika and... Oh, all yeah, that West sure. Nile and all that stuff. So it's, I'm going to die out here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's one of those things where, and it happens in, in L.A., where, <laughs> again, the seasons out here are um, June gloom, uh, Santa Ana's, and pilot season. Santa Ana's. That's the Santa Ana winds. Oh, okay. Whenever it's really we windy, that's what that they call it, the Santa Ana winds. Is that what we're experiencing now? Because yeah. it's May and it's kind of chilly and windy? Yeah. Yeah, uh, the seasons in a, but seasons in LA don't change that much, so it's hard to remember when something happened because <laughs> the weather's always the same. Yeah, it's like always, how long ago was that? It's it's such a, a beautiful change for me, man, to have heat during the day, but not like crazy humidity, 150 degrees heat. Uh, it's like 80. The first summer I was living in LA. It was one of those summers where if you're in the sun, it was warm, but if you're in the shade, it was a little chilly. Okay. And that's as hot as it got all summer. That's perfect. And I was like, I'm never leaving. Yeah, this is perfect. And then the next two summers, it was over 100 degrees for months. Yeah. And this is also the kind of town where it's really hard to find air conditioning. Yeah, I noticed that a few places we looked at did not have AC. Well, if you're on the west side, that's not a problem. If you're on the east side where I've always lived, it's a problem. It didn't used to be, but it is now. Yeah, we saw yeah. a few. We saw a few spots. I saw a spot in Hollywood, and it had one AC unit for the entire two bedroom apartment. And I'm like, no, that's, that's not enough. That's why I moved into my girlfriend so I could afford air conditioning. <laughs> that's why we moved yeah. in together. It was yeah. cheaper to live together and have air conditioning, yeah. and it's great. We get around great, and I'm cooking dinner for her as we speak. Oh, look at that. That's nice. Do you guys use Blue Apron? No, we live in a big apartment complex, which I've never experienced before. It's fine. Mm-hmm. Like I've always had rental houses, or you know, when I lived in Atlanta and worked for for Adult Swim, I owned my own house at okay. 27 years old. 
It's awesome. But you can't do that in LA. No. Cost it's different, of different is world. For sure. Yeah. Rent is expensive. Everything else here you can figure out. But even rent is not that crazy compared to Miami. Like really? Miami, Miami, I was paying, you know, I've, I've seen 1800 for a 2-2. Which is what I'm paying here. I mean, there are certain things that are more expensive here. Uh, doing groceries here is expensive because you got to pay ten cents for a bag, or right. you know, extra taxes, or state taxes, or whatever it is. And you got to drive everywhere. You got to drive everywhere, and it's very, very wearing on your car. Right. Yeah, that's why I only lease cars in LA. Yeah. The roads are bad, drivers are bad. At three years, I'm turning that thing back in and getting another one. And getting another one because I know it's going to be beat up and it's going to have no resale value. Yeah. That's my theory. Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. I we moved here. We finally uh, we we got a car, and I'm doing Lyft on the side to try and make some extra cash. Because why not? Before Lyft, I was sitting around writing, and it was a lot of writing, and it wasn't. It started getting discouraging because I'm just writing and then just piling it and just not doing anything. What were you writing? Just different things, man. I you know I wrote a couple different TV ideas, uh, TV show ideas. I've been working on a book for years, which is just basically my life story as it's Mm -hmm. progressed and i know it sounds super narcissistic or whatever it's just so much crazy nonsensical things so many of those things have happened and i want to catalog it so down the road if you know i succeed at whatever i'm doing i have this catalog of all the nonsense that got me there (laughs) it's just so crazy the the thing any writer has that no one else has is their perspective on things right and south florida is a place that is hard to capture unless you've lived it Mm-hmm. Florida in general, yeah. The beer business is different than anyone thinks it is. Production, oh my god, is different than anyone thinks there it are is. So, so many, yeah, those that's great. Yeah. That's great. Keep there are going. So many layers to the beer business itself that most people don't get. You know, you get the the norm. Most people go to the brewery and like, I love beer and I want to try this beer. And oh my god, that's delicious. And thank you guys for making that beer. And that's about it. You don't see the the headaches of having to deal with distribution companies and. Oh, we don't have the right hops for this beer. Do we change the name of the beer because it's well, now sure. a different beer? And like, it's just. And then, okay, well, now we got to come up with a name for the beer. But all these names have already been copyrighted, <laughs> so like, we got to figure out how do we do that. Like, one of the recipes I was helping out with Cigar City, uh, the name that I wanted was copywritten in a different language, and I didn't know that that translates. You know? Really? Yeah. So I wanted to call it Libertad. Because I wanted it to be Cuban themed, sure. and I, I wanted it to have like this whole Scarface thing because of the oh, chant is Libertad, it. whatever. And they're like, "Sorry, but Anchor Steam Liberty Ale." <laughs> I'm like, "Oh fuck, no!" So yeah, we sure. went we went through sure. like ten different names before we got to Guayabera, which is what we ended up with. Oh, that's fun. Yeah, that's fun. Well, the hard part about beer is scale. You can't. Sc- it's hard. It must be very hard to scale up a beer. Definitely. Which I've noticed with Goose Island. Yes. Um, well, also because they're brewing at Budweiser. But Yes, that's, that's what I mean. <laughs> oh, yeah. And I know Cigar City is being distributed far further than they had been before. Well, they got purchased by Oscar Blues. Right. Yeah. And they would come to Atlanta for a couple months and then disappear. You're not going to maintain your market or your fan base or your drinkers like that. If you can't be con- if you can't be consistent and that's really hard to do. Yeah. That's one of the topics I wanted to bring up to you is uh where <clears throat> where craft beer is right now. It's in a very peculiar situation where it's never been. If you want to drink that so we can switch Oh yeah, yeah. One. Sorry. No, it's okay. So <laughs> <laughs> I, I have I literally more. have one sip left. I have, <laughs> I have one sip left. I'm being bullied. Hurry up, man. Amateur. No, I'm just kidding. So yeah, things are in a weird spot right now for craft beer in general, and it's kind of frightening because uh, it's getting to that point where you either you either sell out to a Budweiser or a Miller or a Heineken and go big, or you embrace your size. Medium sized breweries are almost non-existent. Yeah. right now it's 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 almost like the film business. Yeah, you're either a hundred million dollar movie, or you're or on YouTube, or you're a hundred thousand dollar <laughs> indie. Yeah, 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 yeah. or a fifty thousand dollar indie, or a forty thousand dollar indie. Yeah, no, it's it's insane, man. And it worries me a bit. It kind of puts me off. So, yeah, it's kind of frightening, man, because I, I always had this dream of eventually opening up my own spot. No, it's okay. Opening your own spot as, as a brewery? Yeah, because, you know, I, I fell in love with the, the beer industry and always wanted to be involved. And um, wanting to open up my own place, the dream went from, I'm going to open up a brewery, like a production brewery. And then after working at a production brewery for a couple of years, I'm like, no, not doing that. <laughs> Way too many headaches, expanding, making sure you, like, small details. So hard. Small so details hard. that are, like, 
the right zoning area to open up a brewery and make sure you have the right permits and um, all that stuff. And so I didn't want to deal with all that. So I was like, all right, so maybe a small like brew pub situation. But also working in the beer industry, I get to talk to all these bar owners and everything. And, and, it, and you see the headaches that they go through. And it kind of just it bums me out because you either have to be small or sell out. Right. At this point, for a beer, right. and I know, I know breweries in Georgia that that was always their goal, and it hasn't happened yet. But they're still going strong, and we live on opposite sides of LA. Uh, downtown LA, I have five breweries I can walk to. So where else? Like this is yeah, this is why perfection. I moved here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so Mumford, which is great, Boomtown, fantastic, which is a block away, which I love. Of course, the big ones in downtown is Angel City, yeah, Arch District Brewing, uh, and then a little bit further away is. Iron, Iron Triangle. Triangle. Also, that is one of the most beautiful places to drink. Um, there's another brewery in, wow. the, in the area. This is really good. So okay, we, let's talk we about just, what we're drinking. Yeah, we just opened up the Omnipolo Bianca, which is a goes style ale brewed with mango and lactose. And you said it's from 2015? Yep, I bought it uh, December 2015. Uh, I like and, that you put the little sticker on it. It's good. Yeah, of course. <laughs> of course. I always put on a caps. I try to put on the caps like... This Hunabu says it right there, 16. Yeah, so my my beer professional side of my of my life okay. is that I took, I guess about uh, five years ago, before I left Atlanta, about two years before I left Atlanta, I was freelance. At the end of the year, I would put money in retirement and pay my taxes. So this particular year, <laughs> I had worked with a friend of mine named Tony Holly, who was a... Uh, uh, Right now, he's a location manager for big budget movies and TV shows. And I worked with him on an independent feature. And I would have conversations with him. And it would be an odd conversation. And then about the third time this happened, finally, Tony said, I'm not Tony. I'm, <laughs> I'm not Eddie. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not Tony. I'm Eddie, his twin. I didn't oh, know he had a twin brother. Man. And I literally had three conversations. With his twin. With his twin. And they would do that just to fuck with each other. That's awesome. Oh my yeah. god, that's great. Yeah, I'm not Tony, I'm Eddie. So that's how I met Eddie. Okay. And Eddie and a friend of his, Cisco, were beer nerds. They went to beer festivals. They're like, there is a, a hole in Atlanta retail for a craft beer store. Mm-hmm. And so they came up with a brand that's brilliant, um, and we're looking for investors. So I took my retirement money, and instead of putting a retirement that year, or for a couple of years, uh, invested in Ale Yeah, the craft beer market. A L E Y E A. H. Okay. It's so like hell yeah, but hell yeah, southern awesome. style. So you're involved in that. So I'm a bit. I'm a. I'm a silent partner in hell yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm on Untapped as hell yeah J. <laughs> okay. And so for the you know until I moved to L.A., uh, I was working in the store once a week, and we were kind of bootstrapping it, you know, as best we could. My investment was they had everything in place except for the last batch of money to fill the store with beer. Right, 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 right. Which is a big, you know... It's a big chunk. Big yeah. chunk. Yeah. So I supplied that with my meatwad money. <laughs> um, and I love it. I loved hanging out in the store. I loved working in the store. And it was a great time in Atlanta to open a beer store. Mm. Because within six months of when we opened, growlers became legal. Which yeah. were never legal before. Yeah. So we put in a... a growler station. A growler station with six taps. Now we're... I think they have maybe ten taps. We never want more than that. Mm. Um, there was a growler store boom in Atlanta by a bunch of not maybe not as beer centric people who thought this was an easy yeah retail. Just, uh, yeah yeah easy and money. they'd open sixty tap stores Jesus Christ but that's a lot of kegs sitting around a lot of a lot of beer going bad going, going bad getting old. sitting in the lines mm-hmm. going bad so we were never do, we're going to do more than ten or twelve lines yeah we wanted to turn our kegs over we wanted to serve fresh beer right and our store is you know twelve hundred square feet. 1,400 square feet. Maybe it's bigger than that. It's got to be bigger than that. Um, maybe 2,000 square Anyway, it's a small store. It's a yeah. shotgun store. But we have lots of every beer you could think of that's not distributed by Anheuser-Busch. <laughs> um, and great service. Uh, and that's all we wanted to do. And we also serve, We also have like local, local meat producers, local sausages, local cheese producers, that kind of stuff. Snacks. That's awesome. It's great. It sounds like a cool spot. It's a great spot. If you're shopping for beer in Atlanta, go to Ale Yeah. It's, it's on College Avenue in Decatur. That's funny you bring that up. So, uh, Wicked Weed. Right. We were just talking about Wicked Weed before we started. <laughs> this week announced that Anheuser-Busch was buying out Wicked Weed out of Asheville, North Carolina. A very, very uh, dear brewery held in the hearts of all the craft beer geeks. Yeah. 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 And again, we're talking about if 
Wicked Weed is going nationwide, how do they scale up a sour program? Right. And they're going to have to start kettle souring, which is fine, but it's not what they're known for. They're known for their wild fermentation. Yeah. How do you do that? You don't. Serve nationwide. You don't. You don't. That's why... And uh, you look at Goose Island that had their Matilda and their, their Four Sisters series that now people don't buy them. They don't care. Uh, I stopped buying... Like, I, I wanted... I, I had so much hope for Goose Island. And their beers are still good. Like, I still drink them if they're around. Um, I'll always drink a Bourbon County if it's around. Yes. <laughs> um, but when I saw the Goose Island girls at a bar uh, giving out keychains, I was like, huh. Yeah. This is going to change. Yeah, yeah. It's a different game, man. And, and, you know, I've seen a lot of brewers that have come out and said, hey, congratulations to the guys. You know, we know them. They worked hard. And, you know, cash out. Fucking right. go live the dream. I, those decisions astound me. Sweetwater in Atlanta, they're huge. Yeah. Why have they not been bought out yet? But, but Wicked Weed gets bought out? They because can... those guys, Budweiser has enough money to hire the right people to do the research for them. And they know that Wicked Weed is a highly sought out commodity in the trade world and in the, the beer geek world. People love Wicked Weed. Does like, that translate to Anheuser-Busch size sales? Uh, no. Or but, do they care? So here, here's the thing. Anheuser-Busch's goal is to crush craft beer. Sure. So why not buy one of the most highly sought after commodities of craft beer and put it under your umbrella and essentially crush it? <laughs> you know, victory for them. It's a, it's a, I don't know how to explain it. It's a, it's a very thin line for me because on the one hand, yeah, I'm happy for them. They built the product and they sold it and they're, they're good. They're set for life. But you could have kept growing on your own and you could have stayed true to your morals and, and all that stuff. And they were in a position, they're, they're four, they had four different locations at this point. They keep, they're growing way past the point of most breweries. Sure. Sierra Nevada did it. They're huge, and they're still not Budweiser or Miller. Sure. Right? I would drink an Ultravez every day. Right. So it's it's one of those things that you could become, you know, we started with one billionaire craft brewer, which was Sam Adams. <laughs> and then Sierra Nevada came second. They were the second craft brewer that, to hit billions. You could be the next one. I'm sure Stone's probably on their way if they haven't oh, already done it. Oh, yeah. But with their distrib- distribution arm. Well, they, they, they also took a, a big hit once they invested all that money in Germany and, and uh, Virginia. They opened up two spots, and that's a ton of money, you know, especially right. Germany. Like, oh, what balls to go to, like, the place that people thought of as, when you think beer, you think Germany, you know? They have uh, the Reinskeboot <laughs> law, you know? So right. I'm going to show up here. I'm going to do it American style. Well, I do see English brewers doing American style IPAs and American style It's beer. caught on, you know, that nobody... Do you know who cares about clean English beer or clean European beer? Brewers. Craft sure. beer fans don't. No, right. Craft beer fans want... Your stout can't just be an imperial stout anymore. It has to be an imperial stout with vanilla, chocolate, cinnamon, barrels. peppers, two different barrels. Uh, sure, we're 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 quickly reaching max maximum density of just make good beer. Yeah, it's they. There's been articles about it for years. It's like the bubble's going to burst, guys. It's eventually going to get to be too much. Sure. And sure. all the brewers and the people in the industry, we just want a clean beer. I just want to drink a beer, man. I enjoy these as well. These are f- fantastic. I, sure. Prairie and Omnipolo. It's always great to sample beautiful things. But if I'm at a concert, I, you know how it was a little weird for me going to hang out with Macedon and Braun, and I had my book bag with my little freaking snifter glasses at a concert. I'm like pulling out snifters, and <laughs> I had to open up. I brought a canty on. I had to get a corkscrew out, you know. I love you. <laughs> Thank you. I don't. I don't listen to the same kind of music as you do, but I love you. <laughs> I will go. I will come drink with you at any concert. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. So what music do you listen to? Um, and how did you end up friends with Mastodon? If you don't listen to that music, uh, well, living in Atlanta, I'm. I met Braun through his wife Suzanne. Okay. Who is a drummer in several different bands. One of her bands is called Catfight. Oh, I know Catfight. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. They play the occasional show still. In 2004, I had been making short films, so I had to challenge myself with trying to make a feature. Because I love editing, uh, but I wanted something to edit that was all my own. Okay. As a professional editor, you're editing for someone else all the time. Yeah. And it's very satisfying to 
have your own thing that you make all the decisions on. If you're a writer, producer, always hire an editor. I'm never going to do that. <laughs> but you should. Well, that's, that's one thing that's been a problem for me, even with this podcast. I hate editing. I hate sitting there for five hours cutting out the empty spaces and sure. all that stuff. But at the end of the day, I don't think I can trust anybody with that. I know what I want to hear. I know the comedic timing that I want. Sure. You know, so it's, uh, I don't know. I don't know. I'm with you. I don't know how I feel about hiring an editor, but yes, they are Uh, important. So yeah, Um, everyone I've ever dated has complained that my stories go on too long. So I'll try not to. Like, (laughs) you ask me what kind of music I listen to, I'm going to tell you some other story. Okay. Um, But I met Suzanne uh, when she was drumming for Catfight because I was I wanted to write a rock and roll movie, and I love '60s rock and roll. I'm a garage rock, soul, R and B, '50s soul, '60s R and B, garage rock fanatic. You can see my record collection here. Nice. I like um, that you have, you know, separated by genre or soundtracks yes. and compilations. Yes. It's very uh, nice. These are all my records. My girlfriend's records are in a different pile. <laughs> oh, okay. Everything else all we've right. merged. We've merged our tiki mug collection. Okay. Our furniture. <laughs> but the records stay separate. <laughs> gotcha. Um, so I was looking for, I was watching every rock and roll movie from the 60s I could find. And I ended up with a lot of beach party movies like Dick Dale. Okay. Um, the safaris, not the safaris, but you know, actually the astronauts are in one of them. Anyway, these, all these surf bands and sixties garage rock bands. So I started out trying to write my own version of a beach party movie. Okay. <laughs> but me being me, I'm really into old fifties, uh, monster movies. Uh, my favorite movie is it conquered the world of, uh, Roger Corman movie, which I have a tattoo of. Holy shit. Of Beulah, the That's monster from it conquered the world. Nice. Nice. Prove my nerdiness. You also have her on the fridge. Yes, she's also on the fridge. <laughs> um, so I ended up adding a monster to this 60s beach party movie. I grew up growing up in Florida. My dad used to take me fishing in the Everglades. Okay. And he would try to scare us with stories of the skunk ape. <laughs> Are you familiar? I am familiar. So he'd say things like, see how that tree's bent over? Skunk Ape did that. Uh, so I wrote a movie about a 60s girl band, because yeah. I've got to live with this project forever, so I want to have girl group garage rock <laughs> that I have to stare at for years. Yeah. Um, and they're on tour in Florida, and their van breaks down. At the same time, a skunk ape washes up on shore and starts, shore and starts terrorizing the town. Okay. And it's a movie called Stomp, Shout, Scream. And I was kind of like absorbing and, and um, I was kind of like watching all the source material I could to figure out, you know, Tarantino style, what I'm going to steal from. <laughs> uh, and Catfight had this amazing, sad, slow song about a girl with syphilis. Oh, that's great. And I took that song... <laughs> And added it to, in every Beach Party movie at some point, Annette Funicello gets pissed off at Frankie Avalon and walks the beach singing a lonesome lament. And I added syphilis to that moment in Beach Party movies. They're like, that's a great moment. That happens on page 70 of my script. So I literally wrote the whole script to get to that point (laughs) so that I could use that song and have that moment. Uh, So that became Stomp Shout Scream. Uh, And I shot it in fall of 2004. In Bradenton, where I grew up. Okay. Uh, and Atlanta, where he shot the interiors, shot the exteriors in Bradenton on the beach. Is this out? Yes. Okay. It's available. I It got distributed by a distribution company a couple years later and rebranded as Monster Beach Party A Go Go. How does that happen if it's your creation? Well, um, because I had been selling it myself, mm-hmm. like I printed up a bunch of DVDs and was selling DVDs at film festivals and online. Okay. In order to get into Netflix and on Amazon, they had to rebrand it as a new movie. Because if your movie's been out for a couple years, the big box stores and the big online distributors won't take an old movie. Huh. Um, Did not know that. That's crazy. So, yeah. Monster Beach Party is not a new title. It's a descriptor. So, I kind of hate the title. But it's out there as Monster Beach Party a go-go. Or you can... Find Stomp Shout Scream on YouTube or something. Uh, it's, you go to stompshoutscream.com. Oh, okay, and, and it's there. Awesome, awesome. Um, if you want a signed DVD, they're available oh. from me personally. All right. <laughs> um, yes, pick that up. I don't care what your taste in movies and music is. <laughs> uh, Monster Beach Party of Go Go, the retitled version. It's on Netflix DVDs. But not on Netflix streaming. They still do that. I know that. They, they, they still do that. Well, oh. because their catalog. 
is enormous. Yeah, yeah. DVD wise, but streaming, it's very, it's pretty small actually, compared so, to the amount of movies that are out there. I think it's on Hulu, maybe. So I was gonna say, like, what's? It's streaming. It's out there streaming. It's somewhere. streaming somewhere. Yeah. Susan, Suzanne was the drummer for Catfight, and we used to hang out, and that's how I met. Is she in the movie? No. Um, okay. Catfight wrote the original songs. Okay. For the film, they wrote four. They uh, recorded four songs for the film. Gotcha. The title, Stomp Shot Scream, which is weird because in the re in the re uh, branding, mm-hmm. the title song is Stomp Shot Scream, but the title comes up as Monster Beach Party of Go Go, which is fine, whatever. <laughs> um, uh, and then they wrote two original, two other original songs, uh, and then they covered uh, uh, Go Go Gorilla. Which is one of my favorite old '60s obscure stomp, stompy garage rock songs. Yeah, for me. Um, so that's how I met Suzanne and how I met Braun through production of the movie. And uh, I hired three actresses, and then Jennifer actually Jennifer, the singer of Catfight, who wrote most of the songs, came over and taught the lead actress how to play the chords, so they could okay. mime. So that it looks authentic. It looks as good as any '60s beach party movie, if not better. That's good. Yeah, I actually found an actress who learned how to drum. <laughs> yeah, I respect that, awesome. man. I respect that you you wanted that to to come through in the film because so many times I watch a movie as a musician, I'm just like, oh bullshit, what are you doing? Don't look at the chords <laughs> too closely. She's, she's in the she's in the ballpark. Okay, as long as it's the ballpark, I'm all right with yeah. it. I okay. did my I did my uh, I did a little share of of uh, fake performance uh, on television once. Yeah, I'll do more of that for sure. Yeah, I I got hired to do uh, play keyboards for. A Latin Grammy nominee. Uh, her name was Alejandra Alberti. Uh-huh. She was getting nominated for Best New Artist for the Latin Grammys, and it was just awful, <laughs> awful music. You know, like da 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 da, you know, whatever. Just super poppy, super just commercial music. And uh, they they offered me the gig. They're like, I think it was like 175 bucks <laughs> to come in at 7 a.m. and pretend to play keyboards during her really? performance during a morning just to, show. Just to be. In the neighborhood. Right. For a morning show. It was uh, on Univision. It was the Wake Up America Univision version. It was Despierta sure. America. And yeah, I'm there, like, <laughs> Castro hat, black shirt, and just pretending <laughs> like I'm playing. And I, le- I actually went home and, like, listened to the song and memorized the notes. So that when I played it, people saw me on TV. They're like, oh, he's actually playing, even though nothing's plugged in. But, you know, there's no, there's no amplifiers. Nothing was plugged in. I had no cable coming out of my keyboard. <laughs> Not even power. You <laughs> went above and beyond. Yeah. Like, I'm going to pretend like I'm playing this because who cares, you know? And, and maybe they will they won't realize that it's not plugged in and there's no power or anything. But there's nothing wrong with doing that for a few bucks, being on TV. And no. it, it, was a, it was one of those things. If she would have won the Grammy, they would have taken me on to do the tour and the whole <laughs> thing but she lost and just kind of quit Man. But, but it was great though because she was a young girl I would say 21, 22 oh my god and a good looking girl you know but she walks in it was like 7.30am I'm sitting in the green room waiting for the show they're doing their things they do a bunch of bits before we go on and there she just shows up with a bottle of bourbon at 7, 7 in the morning a.m. she's like shots I'm like what? what are you talking about? she's like your shots I'm like okay we got wasted before we got on there. <laughs> it was fantastic. <laughs> Let's go back to beer. Um, what got you into craft beer? What was your first craft beer? Um, I have been into craft beer since I, for as long as I can remember. I can definitely remember drinking my first Budweiser out fishing on a boat with my dad and hating it. At age? It was so bitter. What age? Eight. Eight, okay. It was Florida. And just probably just having a sip. But it was yeah. so bitter and gross. Yeah. And so in high school, I would gravitate towards anything that was not mass produced, mass marketed. Okay. Which back then was maybe like, which was still mass marketed. It was like Killian's Red. Okay. Because it was different. This yeah, it was, was different. The 80s. It was darker. I mean, and... and it was the, it was Florida in the 80s. Like, yeah. we didn't go bowling on the weekends. We like, let's go drink and go bowling. Right, right. Let's right. go drink and hang out. It was <laughs> Everything is drinking in Florida. Everything, sure. yeah. It was a lot of drinking. And Killian's was also surprisingly cheap. Yeah. Miller Genuine Draft, when it was new, <laughs> was a thing where we drank that on the beach because... You know, and I can remember the first big craft beer experience I had was probably 1990. And I went to Atlanta with some friends. Maybe it was earlier than that. And we went to Taco Mac. 
which is still around. Um, they have several franchises in Atlanta. But I went to the Taco Mac in Virginia Highlands, and they had 100 beers on their bottle list. Oh, yeah. um, and I remember drinking a Mambo, which is an a African beer. Okay, sounds African good. stout. And I don't know, maybe it, like, it may have been like Guinness, where it's actually brewed in Canada and just slap a label on it. Sure. I don't know. Yeah. Maybe not. But it's like, this is a stout from Africa? I got to try that. Yeah, of course. So that's been my mentality for forever. Um, I always want to try, and I, and, I, and I feel like when I go to restaurants, it's the same thing. I want to go to the outside edge of whatever the restaurant's doing. I want to do the thing that's, I want to eat the thing that they're most challenged by. Kind right. of, you know, the most interesting thing that they're doing. Mambo is probably one of the early, like... The earliest ones. Oh, this is crazy. Okay. i got to try this. I'm trying to remember... It's from the Ivory Coast. Um, the other, like, early good beer that I can remember is going to the mall in my hometown, which yeah. had a German, kind of German deli. Oh, I love those. I can't remember what it was called. It was like a franchise. Mm. But they had imported beer that I had never seen anywhere else. So the first... Like, and I'd go there and drink with a fake ID... <laughs> um, the, I think the whole mall is closed. So I don't think I'm getting anyone in trouble. But I had a triple Grimberg in there. Triple, like it's a style, like a triple? Belgian triple. Okay. And for some reason, it was called a triple Grimberg and not a Grimberg and triple. Okay. <laughs> or maybe that's just the way the label was, and I didn't know any better. Well, yeah, some places do things backwards like that. Yeah. yeah. And so that was one of the first beers I remember. Wow, it's Grimberg, and you've got the glasses. Do you have the beer? I don't have the beer. Oh. They don't. That was you know in the '80s. So. A couple of years ago, I found Grim Bergen uh, is still being distributed in the U.S., but I've not seen their triple. This is uh, they they uh, they distribute their double. Okay. Um, but I've not. Oh. Look at the sound. Yes. Let's just listen to the sound. Let's just listen to the sound. Very nice. Um, so yeah, that's one of the first good good beers I remember. Cheers to you. Cheers. For the listeners, we just poured out the Three Floyds Dark Matter Coffee Mastodon Crack the Sky collaboration. One of the better stouts I've had in terms of not barrel aged, not super adjunct heavy, just straight up imperial stout with coffee. I mean, that's what I want, man. That's This is what I want. Obviously, I want to try your pastry stout with vanilla and ice cream and strawberries, mm. but mm. this is what I want all the time. <laughs> yeah, and it's... It's definitely like cafe au lait. Right. Yeah. Kind of milky coffee, but without being... I've had some coffee beers that are just coffee. Yeah. And I'm not a coffee drinker. Yeah. But I love this beer. Yeah, this has more this of is, a... And, it's, and, it's, and I can taste a little... Is it barrel? There's no barrel. There's no barrel. Yeah, it's, it's just the imperial malt. The, the malts that they use and make it, you know, super thick and viscous and mm. not more roastiness to it. So it adds depth of not just the coffee but charred flavors and a little vanilla and what's that i'm gonna read the lyric that's on the bottle okay go for it please tell lucifer he can't have this one her spirits are too strong it's written all over your face i can see the pain you can make it all go away (laughs) it's a perfect poem for a a beer yeah i think yeah i do love Three Floyds, I, I really love, like, where is beer, like, beer has changed in L.A. in the four years I've been here. Mm-hmm. Wholesale. I would go to a beer bar when I first moved here, and they'd have 25 taps, and they'd have 22 IPAs, or pails. Yep, West Coast was world known for that the IPA yeah, love. Yeah, which is their style. Mm-hmm. I, feel like, I feel like every brewer in California used to grow pot, <laughs> and then decided to grow brew their own beer well that is actually literally the case for a lot of stone brewers <laughs> yeah a lot sure. of the stone brewers are, are pot pot growers as well right yeah and i'm malty not hoppy right so i would literally have like give me a scotch ale where's the brown ale mm-hmm. where's the uh, where's the myriad of other styles that's not this side and it's getting so much better S- sours are kind of taking over mm-hmm. everywhere you turn yeah and brewers are doing lots of interesting things I like almost every style uh, equally, except for Roush beers. <laughs> Can't do smoky beer. When it starts to taste like smoke and, and blue campfire. cheese and campfire, and I can't. Uh, Cigar City did one with Max's Lager out in, I think, Georgia. Yeah, Atlanta. And um, it, I found the one spot to drink it at, and it was a place that did these uh, chicken wings that were charred over fire, and together it was perfect. Sure. But outside of that, I can't drink smoky beer. I love cooking with beer. Okay. Yeah. And replace, like, taking a traditional wine recipe and finding the right beer to replace it with. Okay. I love making carnitas. Oh, my God. 
But you, it's literally just a pork shoulder mm-hmm. and a beer and a little water, oregano and, and oranges. Yeah. And put it in a pot and let it let it stew for eight hours. Mm-hmm. And it's amazing. Well, that, that same concept of uh, slow cooking translates to beer as well. There is a lot of slow beer out there. Right. Right. Wild and fermentation, it takes a longer time, barrel aged beer. A Roush beer works with those recipes. Oh, okay. So it yeah, adds it a adds smoky a flavor without having to, with, when you don't have a grill. What is this? This is my favorite cooking beer. Your favorite cooking beer? Mammoth Brewing Company Nut Brown, Double Nut Brown. Double Nut Brown. That's what I make my carnitas with. Okay. And it's a bottle of that, a pork shoulder, and a pot, and kind of nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> and it's amazing. Made with alpine water. Have you ever had that? I have not. I have not. That's awesome. Yeah. I love cooking as well, man. I do a lot of cooking at home. I don't have any training of any sorts, but I've watched every episode of Iron Chef America and Good Eats and Mm -hmm. uh, Chopped and what was the other one that he did? Um, Alton Brown shot his whole Alton Brown show in Atlanta. Yeah. I love that dude. He's one of my favorites. Great. Uh, What was the other show he did? Oh, Cutthroat Kitchen. (laughs) That one was just funny. Yeah. But I feel that I would actually excel at that show because that's my whole cooking, my life has been learn to cook to survive. So it's like, hey, what do I have in the drawer today? I have this orange and some asparagus and what else? <laughs> I, I, we'll, we'll make something happen. Sure. You read yeah. a few recipes on the internet, you improvise. Yeah. I mean, even that, like I try not to. I just want to go for it. Like, who cares? Let it stew for four hours. Right. Whatever. Right. It's going to taste uh, great. Back when I was living in Atlanta, I, I, again, this is one of those stories where I have a point but it's gonna take me a while to get there that's fine i was do i was working all the time uh but felt like i was never getting anything done so i wanted to like find a, a hobby that made me sit and do nothing for a while so that I, the time i was working was more productive if that makes any sense okay i wanted a hobby that made me do nothing so i started making barbecue right because that takes forever it takes forever yeah. and it's like a couple days of prep and then all day on a saturday or sunday you literally sit next to the grill and fuck with the grill. You add a a few charcoal briquettes, Mm -hmm. you check the temperature, you just sit there all day long, which I... Typically drinking. Typically drinking good beer. Yeah. Uh, So I I adopted barbecue as a hobby, and I love it. Uh, And my dad at the time in Florida had a hunting camp. He hunted wild turkey, but everyone else in the hunting camp hunted wild hogs. Okay. So he would send me a wild hog leg and so i started trying to perfect wild boar barbecue oh man which is tough because it's super lean yeah so there's a whole like week-long process to making wild boar and you usually get it frozen so he said the best way to defrost it was at the same time to bleed it so you put it in a cooler with ice and open the drain on the cooler and let and just keep adding ice to the top so as it defrosts all the blood from the meat kind of leaches out and drains out of the cooler Gotcha. So in my spare shower, I had a cooler <laughs> with a wild boar leg, which was literally like had a bone in it and everything. The bone was kind of like rough and hacked on either side. Jeez. Okay. Covered in ice mm-hmm. and just leaching blood into the drain. And that would take three or four days. And then I'd brine it. So I'd make a beer brine, which is essentially lots of salt, a dark beer, and a, like a, you know, vegetable, whatever vegetables you want to put in there. Sure. Um... Carrot, celery, onion, and you boil it with a bunch of salt and then let it cool. And then you brine the <laughs> wild boar leg for probably 48 hours. And you take it out of the brine, wash it off, and then put it in the fridge for 24 hours so that it kind of reconstitutes itself. Yeah. This is like a seven day process. Sure. And then you smoke it for eight to 12 hours. Jesus. So that was that became my hobby. <laughs> well, it's such a it's such a good hobby that I re, I respect people that take their time with stuff like that because you know we're we're living in a we're living in a time where everything is instant gratification. You know. Yes. Like even but businesses are picking up on it. I now that I I drive around a lot, I'm listening to the radio and I hear these new Little Caesars has these pizzas and they're like, oh, it's this new smokehouse pizza and we have six hour smoked brisket and eight hour smoked pulled pork on this pizza i'm like no you don't no, <laughs> it's you, all in a can yeah you guys are not sitting there smoking your meats like there's no way that that's happening yeah so, it's liquid smoke yeah and it's it I, I much rather have like i love that have a sun for me it has to be sunday is the only day i have off so it's like sunday barbecue and spend all day doing that watch tv or whatever put on a game or a ufc fight if there's a fight or <laughs> and lately i've been watching uh wrestling 
because I've fallen <laughs> back into that world for some reason. Like it's I know back. You know, there's minor league wrestling outside of L.A. Yeah, yeah, indie indie wrestling. Indie is, wrestling. I've been trying to get into PWG, which is the uh, PGW or I don't, I don't know, but it's like uh, guerrilla wrestling and it's super indie. And I've been trying to get into that because. I don't know. I've been appreciating more. I know that it's fake. You know, people are like it's fake. I but know it's people, fake. but any any environment where you have people that are communing together, mm-hmm. well, I would think wrestling crowds are not that dissimilar in their in their love of the event and each other than a Comic Con crowd. Sure, sure. Or any kind of or an indie beer crowd. Yeah, everybody's in, it's a community. Yes, for sure. And I love and, it. And that's a little harder to find in a modern world than it used to be. Yeah. I've been falling more and more into, I mean, uh, before I met Ariel, I was never into cons. Um, she's the one that got me into Supercon. Oh, right. Yeah. Like, we were dating, and she, you know, we started dating. She's like, there's this convention going on if you want to go to it. And I'm like, ah, ah cons, like, there's nerds everywhere. <laughs> but I'm a nerd, too. You know what I mean? Like, I love video games and comic books and all this stuff. So I'm like, ah, I guess let's go check it out. Why not? Whatever. And now I'm hooked, and I can go. I want to go to all of them, as many sure. as I can go to. And the beer community—that was one of the things that attracted me. Was everybody gets together, everybody puts down a beer. Hey, check this out! I brought this from my cellar, and this from my cellar. And we communicate and talk about it and appreciate it. And and yeah, it's it's just it's a beautiful thing to me. And it, and it it's nice that it overlaps in different ways. One of my beer partners in Ale, yeah, board games. Oh yeah, he just yeah, loves it, and yeah. he'll go to Dragon Con in Atlanta. And I go to used to go to Dragon Con every year, but I would never see him because we had different circles. Right. He was in the board game room, and he would bring <laughs> a cooler full of beer. Yeah, and they do that whole thing all all, and all day long. Yeah, all day long playing whatever it was. Yeah, it's interesting to me when I see that. Like we walk around like SuperCon, and we'll see the upstairs, and they're all up there just playing board games. I'm like, but guys, there's so much other, like there's things going on. <laughs> they just they don't care. That's just their that's world. It's a thing, and they love it, and they yeah. commune, and it's great. Yeah, I, I love it, man. And it, it's, it's one of the things that, that really gets me, that's been attracting me more and more as I get older. Like, I love this whole community thing. And it's something that's missing in our, I think, in our society. Like, Absolutely. Everybody wants to just text, or which is More, more bottle shares. More bottle shares. All the time. All the time. All the time, bottle shares. I, that's one of the things that I love. Uh, that's what's gotten me to where I'm am, am at right now with the podcast. Is bands in town. Hey, what are you guys doing? Want to get together and drink? Yeah, I'll bring beers. Not a problem. Let's do this. And just you've got your three inch by two inch recorder. Tiny recorder. Put it down. Talk. Drink. It's awesome. Now, let me. I wanted to something that I had actually in the beginning of my notes, but now we're wrapping up, kind of getting close to the end here. But how did you get into the editing world? Because it's a very pe- peculiar. It's, very, it's a it's a very specific talent. You're yeah. you're kind of half librarian, half writer. And then my follow-up question. Half psychologist for whoever you're dealing with. the couch right. behind you. Yeah, yeah. And, and then my follow-up question, how many gigabytes of sound effects do you have saved up? <laughs> <laughs> um, like I said, I went to Auburn uh, University for college, and it's kind of an engineering or uh, business school. Mm-hmm. I didn't really fit into either of those camps, but I liked going to college there. Mm. And I took an editing class and went in to edit a project and edited for, I think, 12 hours without noticing the time go by. <laughs> um, so I went in to edit on a Sunday, forgot to eat, forgot to pee, didn't notice the 12 hours go by, mm-hmm. and literally changed my major the next day to communications. Wow. Okay. And I was like, I should probably do this for a living. Uh, back then it was like literally tape to tape with a little Panasonic controller in between. Oh my goodness. Very analog. So how, uh, how how much has that evolved from the tape to when you worked at like early ninety was it ninety one ninety three I, I uh, graduated from college in ninety one okay uh, moved to Atlanta because that's where a lot of production was happening CNN uh, and it was close to where I was living already mm-hmm. um, this is a very good beer <laughs> it is fantastic man it is really it's good. really it's luscious all right so going back yeah going back. Uh, so I changed my major the next day and moved to Atlanta. My first job, I didn't have, couldn't find work for a couple months. I literally sent resumes to every editing post-production facility I could find mm-hmm. and had a few interviews. Um, finally had an interview where the guy liked me. He said, I'm going to bring you in to do some, some of this bullshit editing when it comes around. Great. I'm in. And then he had a position come open. It's a place called Magic Lantern. It's a post-production facility that did Turner promos, 
um, regional advertising corporate videos. And so I worked there for three years. I was like a night manager. And it's one of those things where the right place at the right time. When I got hired there, there were exactly two nonlinear computer editing systems in all of Atlanta. Like everything, all editing is computer editing now. Yeah, yeah. Back then it was tape to tape. There were two Avid systems in Atlanta and one was at Magic Lantern. And my first job was, one of my first jobs was to load footage from tape into the computer overnight. So it'd be ready for the next morning's, you know, car commercial or retail commercial. So I spent overnight working on the systems, digitizing all the footage. Uh, and I learned how to, how they ran. Like they broke a lot. Back then, the biggest hard drive you could buy, which is about the size of a car battery, was 600 megabytes. Oh, no. I'm not kidding. <laughs> so the resolution was very low. Yeah, yeah. Um, but it was computer editing. Uh, so I learned on the first generation of Habits, literally version two. Wow. And then a couple of years later, uh, I got a job working at Turner Broadcasting because they had a couple of Avids, but didn't know how to manage them. So they hired me to manage them, and I also edited. So I became full-time editor during that period. And Space Ghost was looking for an editor. I was like, let me try. So the first episode of, the first real, the first promo I edited <laughs> was for the Western miniseries Lonesome Dove. Oh, okay. Back when it was on reruns, like constantly on TBS, mm -hmm, TNT. Mm -hmm. So yeah. Coming up next, Lonesome Dog. <laughs> that was the first promo I ever edited. That's that was my awesome. first really editing gig. And then my first job editing long format was an episode of Space Ghost where the guest was Carrot Top. Oh, man. Wow. <laughs> and mm. it was episode like 19, 17, 18, 19 of Space Ghost. This is pre-steroid use. Yes. Okay. Yes. He also, like within that period, he also had a morning show on Cartoon Network. What? I don't know. The I guys know. who created Archer. Okay. Produced the Carrot Top Morning Show on Cartoon Network. Wow. Back in the day. Jeez. So uh, yeah, I know those guys from the 90s. That's awesome. I love Archer, by the way. That's one of my favorite shows. Yeah, great show. I haven't seen the newest season, but I've seen everything up to Vice, I think it was. Right. Yeah, they uh, kind of recreated every year, which is interesting. Yeah, now they're doing what? Noir, I think it was. Archer Noir. Uh, yep. I forget the guy's name. He, the voice actor does also uh, Bob's Burgers. Benjamin. Uh, Benjamin. Yeah, John uh, Benjamin. John Benjamin. Yeah, he was also in the live action uh, Aqua Teen episode. He played Master Shake in that. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Which I love. I think it's great. That was such a crazy episode, oh, man. Oh, it's With, insane. Little John. T-Pain. No, T-Pain, right. T-Pain. T-Pain. Playing Frylock. It's funny. Uh, I went on a cruise with T-Pain. <laughs> it was great. <laughs> Not everybody can say that. Yeah, yeah. Um, He's obsessed. He's adult swim obsessed. Yeah. Oh yeah. It was, I thought it was great because he did. Uh, it was the I'm on a boat thing that he did with Lonely Island, and they did a cruise that left Miami to the Bahamas. Jesus. The I'm on a boat cruise, <laughs> and you, I bought tickets because I was like, "Fuck yeah, I want to go on a cruise with T Pain and, and the Lonely Island Boys." They promoted it as the Lonely Island Boys were going to be there. Never showed up. T Pain did show up. Uh, I ran He's into, a good guy. Great guy. I ran, into, guy. I ran into him in the cruise, and I'm like, hey, man, you know, this is cool, man. I really appreciate you doing this. And he's like, I fucking hate boats. He's <laughs> <laughs> like, I am freaking out right now. You have no idea. I'm going back to my room. I'm like, oh, uh, <laughs> sorry. I'm sorry you feel that way. Why would you write a song about being on a boat then? <laughs> it was this weird mash of yacht rock and... Hip hop, yeah, it was beautiful. I thought it was awesome, hilarious. That first whole Lonely Island album to me was fantastic. I was on Instant Messenger with a friend of mine, and he was like, "Hey, you want to hear this new album?" And it was a hip hop act that I didn't know. Okay, I was like, "Does it sound like Louie Louie?" And he was like, "No," I was like, "Ah, probably not interested." <laughs> so I find that <laughs> for me, when you pick a genre mm -hmm. and start deep diving into it. It opens up into this chasm of subgenres. Oh or yeah. Yeah, 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 varieties of the thing. I'm obsessed with the twist, the like, band, like Chubby Checker is the twist. Okay, okay, but not the twist because that was actually phenomenon for like two years. Mm. Like, you, like when something becomes a meme or a, pheno a national phenomenon, it goes even, viral or whatever, or something goes viral, it's two weeks. Yeah, until the next thing hits. The twist in the early '60s. 
that was a, a thing for years. For like two years. <laughs> People were obsessed with the twist. Right. And it, it was also like the first dance that it ended partner dancing. Before then, all Everybody dancing was a partner. Right. Male, female, partner dancing. Sure. And the twist was something you could do by yourself. Yeah. So it changed everything. So for years after that, people were trying to come up with the new twist, the next twist. Right, right. So I'm, I'm obsessed with the twist, but I'm obsessed with all the songs that, that came were from not it. the twist. Right. The Hully Gully. <laughs> you know, the Pony. Gotcha. The Tootsie Roll. The Tootsie Roll. <laughs> that may be a little more 80, but yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm obsessed with that stuff. Yeah. So once you dive into that, hundred, I literally have hundreds and hundreds of songs that are not the twist. Okay. Do you collect those in vinyl? Uh, some vinyl, mostly digital, because it's a lot of like old comps. Okay. Or old singles that are comped on old vinyl compilations. Gotcha, gotcha. I don't feel bad downloading those because <laughs> the vinyl didn't like license them to begin with. Sure, sure. <laughs> I feel, you know, the downloading thing did hurt the music community a lot. But for me personally, like, I, I appreciate it. Because I like to, I'll download an album, and if I like it, I'm buying it. Yeah, and I'm not buy just, the vinyl. I'm not just, yeah, I'm not just buying the digital copy for nine ninety nine. I'm going to go buy the 30-something dollar vinyl, collector's edition with the thermos or whatever you're throwing <laughs> in there. You know, I'm all in. If, no. if you're doing good music, I'm all in. Yeah, know? there's things people will pay for. Mm. It's no longer content. Right. It's right. now authenticity. Yeah. Memorabilia. Or packaging. Yeah, yeah. Memorabilia. Yeah. yeah. There's other things people will pay for. Experiences. Sure. Sure. You know? And a lot of the things, like, for me personally, when it comes to buying a record, I like to buy it from the band itself. Like, I'll, go, I'll wait. Absolutely. You know, like, hey, we got pre-orders. That's cool. I'm going to go to your show. I'm going to buy it from you. Yeah. Uh, unless it's like a ridiculous pre-order, like the band Ghost had one with like... They were selling you a Bible that you can open up, and there's a dildo in it in the shape of the singer. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing you're like, uh, I might have to pre-order that. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Have you heard the band Ghost? I, I'm familiar. You're familiar? Do you like them? You Do they like sound them? like Louie Louie? <laughs> no, but they sound like the Blue Oyster Cult or, or uh, King Crimson, you know? They sound like 60s, 70s classic rock. Not interesting. Not interesting? Just kidding. <laughs> Oh, man. It's funny because a lot of people think they, they see me and they see my online presence and whatever, and it's always metal, which is predominant for me, for sure. But I do listen to everything, man. One thing that nobody knows about me is that I used to, well, a few people know, but close friends know. I used to teach people how to dance salsa. Really? Yeah. Like, I, that's how deep I can go. Like, I can teach you how to dance casino, which is where you pair off couples and you dance in a circle around each other and... Uh, Trade off partners mid song. Awesome. There's always like an anchor. There's a person who yells out the moves. Right. So you start off the song. You're Almost dancing. Latin square dancing. Yeah, pretty much that. You, you're in a circle and it's a three, four, five couples, and one guy is chosen to just yell out like the mountain, and everyone <laughs> everyone does the mountain move where you <laughs> make a weird shape with your sure. arms, or whatever. Sure, and you stab the Game of Thrones character. Right. Right. Blow his eyeballs out of his skull. <laughs> um, <laughs> you take your partner down to the ground and press in on the eyes. No, um, they, <laughs> no they, do, they do like all the moves and then you switch partners, which is super weird. I mean, at the time for me, it was great because I was single. Sure. So I was like, uh, next girl, next one. Yeah. Um, but Dance speed day. Yeah, it was, it was really weird get, falling into that world for a bit. Mm -hmm. But I enjoy just all kinds of music, anything. And I like going deep. Like, give me your nerdiest shit yeah. in that genre that you got. Find a genre you, you halfway dig and dig deep. Yeah. And it's a chasm that opens up, always. Yeah, yeah I love I, it. And, and our mutual friend, Dana Snyder, oh. who, who I know through editing his voice. <laughs> How many has, hours have you spent listening to Dana's voice? <laughs> we, we both owe our careers to, to the gentleman who created Aqua Teen. Uh, and we're grateful. Yeah. Uh, I edited Dana's voice for three years before ever meeting the man. Wow, really? Yeah. Okay. Uh, the Aqua Teen pilot was in 2000. Okay. And my favorite story is Dana lived in New York, but happened to be visiting his parents and doing a burlesque show in Vegas when they recorded his voice for the Aqua Teen pilot. Okay. And they met Dana in a casino. <laughs> and I can remember Dave telling me the story. It was like, he... 
they were emailing or something, texting maybe. It was 2000. Hmm. I don't know how they were communicating Probably in 2000. Uh, yeah. Not texting, pre-texting. Pre-text. Uh, yeah, that's emails. So or he's like, room. how will we know you? He's like, I'm the guy who dresses like your grandpa. <laughs> That's how they knew who Dana was That's in the pretty casino. accurate. That's yeah. great. That's pretty accurate. Um, so I didn't meet Dana until the first DVD was being made. And they brought him into Atlanta to record uh, commentary. Okay. And we met at Trader Vic's Tiki Bar in downtown Atlanta. And Dana was like, "You're good. Uh, Dave was like, y'all are getting along fine. And we drank <laughs> all night long and have been absolutely fast friends ever since. One of my best friends in LA, uh, easily. That's awesome. And I know he does, and you know him through Supercon. Yeah. Um, I came up with a game that I think maybe he should use. We're pitching this to you, Dana, uh, for his Supercon panels. Okay. Which is, what is this dance? Oh. So like I said, I have literally hundreds of songs that are not the twist. And it's most of those songs are like, this is the next big hit. The lyrics are, this is the next big hit. Here's how you do it. Right, right, right. But it's lyrics that don't necessarily make sense. So you play the song, you get contestants to, to come to, up. To play along to the you song. You play the song, and you're like, what is this dance? Okay. So today was Do the Mother... So I was listening to my iPod on random, and the song <laughs> that came up today was Do the Mother Hubbard. The Mother Hubbard, okay. It's a very obscure 60s <laughs> dance song. Which related are, to L. Ron Hubbard? No. Like, no not related, uh, his mom? Related to the, the storybooks. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right. Do the Mother Hubbard. Okay. And there's all these lyrics that explain how to do the dance, but they don't really make any sense. So you play the song for your contestants, and then you challenge them to do the Mother Hubbard. And the winner advances to the next round. But I literally have dozens of these songs. That's, that's, a, that's a good game show. Yeah, it's that's a game a show, show, right? It's a good super con game show. Yeah, because they have like the match game and all that stuff yeah. that they do. That yeah, it's perfect. a dance contest. But you have to make up the dance for this nonsensical 60s dance song. Dana, I mean, this is a no-brainer. <laughs> Just saying. This is a no-brainer for Supercon. Like, that's perfect. I, I sat through Dana. There, he had a panel in Supercon called Dana Snyder Wastes an Hour of Your Time. Yes, and I'm we, familiar. We sat there and listened to him play... Songs from his phone. Songs from his phone. It was one of like, the Mosquito song that blew my mind. <laughs> It just blew my mind. Like, <laughs> how is this real? Like, there's no way this is real life right now. Yeah. 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 When I first moved to L.A. and leading up to that, I would travel to L.A. And I never really, I always thought I was a New York City guy rather than an L.A. guy mm -hmm. until I spent New Year's in, L in New York City, froze my ass off. <laughs> yeah. And about that same time, I was visiting Dana, staying with him. And I stayed a weekend with Dana and we went to all his favorite places. And none of them had a waiter under 80 years old. And none of them had real, had anything but uh, wood paneling. So we went to the Smokehouse. Right. We went to uh, Musso Frank's. We went to Michelli's. Nice. Which in the middle of like ordering dinner, our waiter who was 65, was like, very good, sir. Very good, sir. Excellent choice. Pardon, <laughs> pardon me. And then went and sang a song with the piano player in the middle of taking our order. <laughs> Sorry, I have to go. And then came back to be like, what would you like, sir? Oh, no. Very good, sir. Very good, sir. Excellent choice. That's and fantastic. Then, and then as Dana says, turned to the kitchen and yelled, two asshole specials. No. <laughs> Old joke. No, yeah, but that's a that sounds beautiful. Like, I would love to be there. That's when I fell in love with Los Angeles. Yeah, yeah. No, yeah. Los Angeles is a beautiful place. There's a lot of history. A lot of history here, especially if you've got Dana as, like, a tour guide. <laughs> He's the best. Yeah, he's taken me on a couple like adventures here, and it's been great. Like, I wish he had more time. And I know he's <laughs> he so busy. Not. One last plug. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is a Dana creation oh. from those experiences at Supercon. The movie? Which is Supercon the movie. Yes. It's a fantastic script shot last July in New Orleans. Starring one of my favorite actors of all time, Brooks Brasselman. <laughs> Brooks Brasman is one of the funniest people on the planet and mm -hmm. will be discovered by this movie. I hope so. Um, it also stars uh, John Malkovich. Yep. So it's a heist comedy set at a comic book convention based on Dana's experiences at Supercon. <laughs> the movie is called Supercon. I've worked with Dana for years, but not until I worked with him editing some stuff he did on, on another show in L.A. that he was like, literally took me aside and was like, you're really good at what you do. 
I've been doing this a long time. And through that, I was hired to edit the film Supercon. Nice. Um, I'm very proud of it. I think it's a very funny movie. And the folks that are into the con world, which is most of the world now, right? Yeah, it's a big thing now, for sure. They get it. Yeah. They get it. And that's how we got amazing actors to be in it, because the script gets that world. Mike Epps is in it too, right? Mike Epps plays the uh, convention promoter. It's amazing. It captures that world that you, the, where you met Dana. Right. Uh, and I'm thrilled to be part of it. It's a fantastic movie. We'll finish it soon. I'm excited. I saw a clip. I don't know if that's from the movie or separate, but I saw a clip of Brooks as the like suave, like... He plays a Brooks Brasman who's a theater actor that no one's ever heard of until now. <laughs> he plays a 70s action hero who yeah. has come out of the closet late in life. <laughs> and he's amazing. I can't wait. I mean... We, we, plus, Brooks is amazing as that character, but we got to shoot clips from him back in the 70s in a fake mustache and fake wig. Yeah, uh, that's what I saw. Incredible. I saw the clips of the movies that he was in, supposedly, yes. yeah. Incredible. Oh, my God. I can't wait. Brooks is so great. Like, he's got natural humor to it. It's like, it doesn't seem scripted. Whenever he does his impressions, like, at Supercon shows, he does, like, the Carol Channing. And Carol the, Channing. Lately, I saw he's doing Richard Simmons. The Richard Simmons that he did last, that I saw a couple weeks ago, is amazing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he's one of my favorite people, for sure. Oh. For sure. He and Dana are of the same cloth where kind yeah. of everything that comes out of their mouth is funny. It's gold. It's gold. And, you know, uh, I get people that, because, you know, I'm very fortunate that I've fallen into the circle of friends for, for Dana. And I have a ton of my friends that, like, see pictures of us hanging out. And they're like, what are you doing? Oh, my God, you're hanging out with Dana Snyder. I'm like, you know what? It's as hilarious as you think it is. It really is. Like, just being around him. Just even nonsense, whatever the hell he's talking about. It's he has a way of projecting. He needs humor. to be like a talk show host. Oh my god! Yeah, yeah. Or yeah. or or the uh, the neighbor on a sitcom or his own sitcom. You know what I mean? Like he's an amazingly talented guy. Yeah, and, uh, I was. I'm, he's in the room. I'm jacking him off right now. <laughs> Let's bring him down a notch. <laughs> Let's bring him down a notch. Asshole. Yeah, yeah. Dave Willis, who does who created Aqua Teen and does the voice of Carl and the voice of Meatwad. That was his voice that he used as the impression of animals when he was talking to children. Oh, okay. okay. Or, you know, that was his his baby voice where you talk to kids or right, right, animals. Right. Yeah. So that ended up being Meatwad. That ended up being Meatwad. Jeez. I'd love to meet him because uh, Carl, to me, is like one of the best voices. Growing up in New Jersey, it's got that Jersey he, vibe to it. Yeah. So. He, it, what, his, it comes from him impersonating his college roommate <laughs> who was from Jersey. Gotcha. Or, you know, taking that influence and sure, sure. making it real. Because it's he's from Conyers, Georgia. Okay. That's where Squidbillies comes from, is he and you know Jim Fortier, who created and write all the Squidbillies, they're essentially writing stories about their high school friends. <laughs> or taking those influences and making them into stories. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, that's where he's from. But... Fucking talented guy. Yeah, it's a good place to get influence from. That one of the shows that I told you that I, I was writing on one of the shows, it's uh, all, all the characters are based off of like my, my bandmates or friends from high school and mm -hmm. stuff. It's mm -hmm. just you gotta you gotta play on what your experience is and what you know. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm gonna wrap this up. Thank you so much for taking your time. Thank, Thank you for bringing beers over. Thank you for sharing beers. Of I course. will do this. I will be like. The guy in the background cracking beers. <laughs> Every time you do this in person. Well, you know what I was thinking about? Uh, I went to Meltdown Comics. Are you familiar? Yeah. And I spoke to one of their gentlemen there, one of the guys that owns... I know Dave does stuff, does stuff there. Yeah. yeah. Does he? I, didn't, I haven't seen so, him. But occasionally, yeah. They, they were telling me, like, if you want to do a live show... But, I mean, I would need to plan that properly and, like, do this live. Sure. Like, uh, Dan Harmon did his, his podcast there forever. He just right. left. So they now have an opening. Nice. So I'm like, I'm thinking about it. I'm like, if I have a big enough guest where we can promote this ahead of time, sure, people, people, will, people will show up, you know. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, that's something. Drinking beer, talk. talking to rock and rollers. Dude, yeah. We just sit there and talk and drink. I'll bring beers and we'll drink them. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that's not, a, like they, that's not a problem. No, it's uh, not. It's well, not. Uh, do you uh, have anything you want to plug in terms of social media? <laughs> Uh, outside of everything you've already plugged. But, sure, uh, sure. I'm, social I'm, media? I'm J. Wade Edwards on Twitter. Instagram. I'm, on, yeah, I'm also J. Wade Edwards on Instagram. 
It's beer, mostly pictures of beer, beer pictures. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> monster pictures, uh, monster, monster stuff. Picture. I come off, uh, and I'd love more friends on Untapped. That'd be great. Uh, I, so I, I'm I, L yeah underscore J underscore J. I'll add on, you actually because I, I don't really untapped. use it much unless I'm out of town. If I'm out of town, then I do it. But. Yeah, I like just keeping track of what I've had and what I haven't had. I tried doing that. I couldn't keep up. It's <laughs> sure. I can't keep it's, up. It becomes like. When I went to Australia for a beer festival a couple of years ago, <sighs> yeah, which is a great, great Australian beer festival, which is what the glasses we were drinking out of. Oh, okay. I cannot recommend it enough. Okay. I just spent. Well, I mean, 10 I'd days love to in, go to Australia anyway. But I yeah. spent ten days in Melbourne drinking beer, and it's much like being in Colorado or Michigan or wherever the beer craft beer craze is exploding. Mm-hmm. Unbelievable. We still haven't drank one of those. We got to drink one of those. We'll drink it now, yeah. Uh, no, no, I don't have to go. No. Okay. We can end this, but we don't have to go. Okay. So, yeah. Yeah. Like Australia, New Zealand. Well, New Zealand's got the best hops in the world. Right. So, if you're in the so hops, they're exploding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the Great Australia, I think it's the Great Australian Beer Festival. Ten days of events and then an all-day Saturday beer festival. Unbelievable. I need to make that happen. I also need to make Oktoberfest happen, even though it's a tourist trap. A tourist trap and a shit show, but I'm with you. It needs to happen once. Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I, I own later hosen. <laughs> I want to own later hosen. <laughs> Damn it. I want a pair. All right, guys. Well, yes. Check out J. Wade Edwards' uh, Twitter, Instagram, uh, Untapped. On L. Yeah. L. Yeah. J. Underscore J. Uh, check out all the shows. I know the season finale of. Your pretty face goes to hell. It just was premiered. this past weekend? Yeah, just premiered. You were worked on that as well. Did you I do worked all on season I did, three? Or yeah, I did four episodes of season three. Okay, I love that show. Okay. It's great. So check that out. Uh, go online. Check out. Uh, what's the picture show you have? Where you oh. recreate recreate movies? <laughs> oh yeah, I, I did a. Uh, uh, sorry, I, I do a lot of things. <laughs> I did a web series last year called the Kino Edwards Picture Show. Yeah. Best place to watch it is on my Vimeo channel. Yet another Oof. thing to look up. <laughs> but it's called the Kino Edwards Picture Show. It's on J. Wade Edwards Vimeo, where I recreated classic movie scenes in my living room with my friends using whatever props and costumes I had around. Right. So, so we did classic movies that I love. So like Double Indemnity, Maltese Falcon... Those kinds of I films. Rushmore. Rushmore is the big finale. Yeah. So skip the episodes where you don't know the source movie. Watch the <laughs> ones where you know the original film well. They still won't make any sense because I changed the genre. So like Maltese Falcon is a superhero movie. Like <laughs> Leotard's superhero movie. Yeah. Um, I did Tootsie. It's a western. Yeah. Um, That's all that. They're <laughs> ridiculous. If you know the source material, they're fun. If you don't, they make no sense. They may make no sense anyway. But it was I was getting fed up with the distance between coming up with an idea and shooting it. Mm-hmm. So this was ten a ten episode web series that I literally shot on my phone with zero crew, just me and actors in my living room. That's awesome. And it was super fun. I think they're interesting. There's a really like one of my favorites is Blade Runner. Oh, yes. And it's the scene where Deckard tells Sean Young that her memories are not her own. Mm. But through the whole series, I flipped the genre, like the gender, on all the actors. So most of my actor friends are are women. Mm-hmm. So the actresses get all the good lines. <laughs> um, nice. So that that's part of the other weirdness. And then in the Blade Runner, she's like, do you remember that spider in the basement? And then we cut to... The flashback of the spider in the basement mm-hmm. playing strip poker. <laughs> it's weird. <laughs> it's good. No, it's really good. I checked, <laughs> I checked out. I didn't see the Blade Runner one, but I did see uh, the Rushmore one. I thought it was great. Uh, definitely check it out. I, I have very talented friends. Yeah. I, would, I, had a, I had a lot of fun shooting it. I, I'm, I, feel, I feel you on that. I have a lot Thank of Thank you for friends. mentioning the Kino Edwards picture show. It's not gotten enough love. <laughs> it's great. Definitely check it out. Uh, Thank you for your time again. Thank you for your beers. Yes. Uh, Please don't forget, share, like, comment, review, all those things that make me relevant on the uh, social media world. (laughs) Thank you for listening. Cheers. Bye.